The Bayesianist philosophy is that when you're modeling something about the world, you should represent anything you don't know by using probabilities. In particular, if you have a model with an unknown parameter, then you should represent it using a random variable. You should start out by declaring your prior belief about that parameter by stating its prior distribution. Then you see the data and you update your beliefs using Bayes' rule to get the posterior distribution for the unknown parameter. In this video, we'll work through some practical examples. We've seen all the mechanics before in earlier videos about Bayes' rule, but I want to go through this again, partly to get you used to the language that Bayesians use, but mainly to remind you that we have two ways of applying Bayes' rule, mathematical and computational, and to put these two ways side by side. Okay, let's state more formally what the Bayesian approach is. The starting point for any probabilistic machine learning exercise at all has to be a probability model for the observed data, the sorts of probability models we've been working with throughout this course. If we observe data little x, we'll imagine there's a random variable big X and that little x is a sample from it, and we'll propose a probability model for big X. For Bayes' calculations, we need to write this probability model out as a likelihood function, the likelihood for big X at seeing value little x. And suppose our probability model has an unknown parameter, call it theta. The Bayesian philosophy is that any unknown should be represented by a random variable, so I'm writing out our probability model as the likelihood of x conditional on the unknown parameter big theta having value little theta. Step 1. We have to declare our prior distribution for theta. We can set it out as a likelihood function, the likelihood for big theta of value little theta. This measures our degree of belief in the hypothesis that the unknown parameter's value is actually equal to little theta. Step 2. Apply Bayes' rule to find the posterior distribution of the random variable theta conditional on the observed data. This step is called the Bayes update step. Step 3. Once we know the posterior distribution, we could plot a histogram or report it in whatever other way we like. Let's flesh out these three steps. Here's the computational approach first. This is a recap of what we learnt in section 5.2. For step 1, we'll take a sample of values from the theta random variable. For step 2, we compute weights, one for each sampled theta value. We let weight wi be the likelihood of the data set, conditional on the parameter taking value theta subscript i, and then we rescale all the weights to sum to 1. For step 3, we can use these weights to estimate posterior probabilities. Here's a formula, but in section 5.2 we saw a code snippet for plotting a histogram of the posterior distribution making use of these weights, and that's probably more useful than the formula. Alternatively, we can do all this mathematically using the method from section 4.2. Step 1. Write out the prior likelihood function. Step 2. Write out the posterior likelihood function using Bayes' rule and find the constant kappa that we need to make this be a valid density function. Step 3. Whatever we want to report, we should derive it from the posterior likelihood function. For example, we could simply plot, plot the likelihood function. OK, that's the theory. Now let's use it. I have a coin which might be biased, blah, 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 blah. Using the prior distribution, blah, find the posterior distribution. Here are the standard steps for solving these problems computationally. Starting point is the probability model for the data. The question doesn't tell us explicitly, but we've seen enough coin toss examples to write down a sensible model. Let's say random variable big X is binomial with parameters n and theta. We know n is 12, and we don't know theta. Next step, take a sample of theta values from the prior. The question tells us to use a uniform prior, so that's what we're sampling from. Next step, compute the weights. The weight is just the likelihood function for the data, and we write that out at the top. I didn't bother computing the binomial coefficient at the front because we're going to rescale the weights to make them sum to 1, and so any non-theta factors will just cancel out. Finally, 
report whatever we want. For example, we could plot a histogram of the posterior distribution, and we can do that very easily with matplotlib using the weights equal w option. So that's all there is to the computational approach. Let's run through this again, but we'll do it mathematically this time. Our probability model for the data is exactly the same as before. It's just the next three steps that are different. Step one, write out the prior likelihood function. The question tells us that the prior distribution for theta is uniform in the range zero to one. So the prior likelihood function is constant, equal to one. Step two, use Bayes' rule to find the posterior likelihood. The answer is some constant kappa times the prior likelihood for theta times the likelihood for the data set X that we wrote out above. We don't need to carry around the non-theta factors. We might as well just amalgamate them all into the constant kappa. And then we could use integration to find kappa, or if we're cleverer, we'll spot that this looks like a standard density function that we know and love. And after a quick trip to Wikipedia, we can identify the posterior distribution as a beta with parameters x plus one and n minus x plus one. Finally, report the posterior however we like. We could just stop here and say it's a beta random variable, or we could plot the likelihood function. It's a standard random variable, and so we can find its PDF in the standard library scipy.stats. Good, this is basically all there is to Bayesian inference. But I'm going to go through another example just to highlight some of the things that might be confusing the first time you see them. Here's the example. We have a sample of values x1 up to xn drawn from a uniform distribution in the range a to a plus b, where a and b are unknown parameters. OK, we're being Bayesians here. We're going to treat unknown parameters as random variables. Either we have to pluck them out of thin air ourselves, or we look for them in the question. And this question tells us precisely what to use. Next, the part of the question that might be confusing. It asks us, find the posterior distribution for B. You might have alarm bells going off now. OK, I want to find the posterior for B, so I should write out the prior for B. But then where does A come into the picture? Hold tight, stay focused, and just follow the steps exactly as we put them up before. Let's take the computational approach first. First, we start with a probabilistic model. These are the general guidelines shown on the left, but we have to translate them to our setting. What is X? X should always be the entirety of the data set that we're given. It's a sin to waste data when we could be using it to learn from. So here, X denotes the entire sample x1 up to xn. What's theta? Theta should always be the entirety of all the unknown parameters. There are two unknowns here, a and b, and theta stands in for the pair a comma b. OK, so now let's write out the probability model here, the likelihood of x. We've looked at this sort of probability model several times already in the course. Here we have a sample x1 up to xn. First, I've written out the likelihood for a single observation. And also because the boundaries a and a plus b are what we want to reason about, I'm, I've written out the likelihood in this indicator function notation. That's a trick we used right at the beginning of the course. And then the likelihood for a sample x1 up to xn is just the product of the likelihoods for each individual data point, assuming independence. The question doesn't tell us that they're independent, but the general rule I've told you to follow is to assume that the question means independence unless it explicitly tells you otherwise. Still, we're making this assumption, so I'd better write down the assumption we're making. Finally, just a little bit of algebra to tidy it up. I'm going to want to evaluate this likelihood function for every single one of the sample parameters theta i, so I might as well write it in a way that lends itself to a slightly faster implementation. Here, because of the way that the indicator functions multiply together, the whole product only comes out to be 1 if all of the xi are in the range a to a plus b, or in other words, if the min of the xi is larger than a and the max of the xi is smaller than a plus b.
Good. Now on to the next step. Take a sample theta1 up to theta n from the random variable theta. Remember, we said that theta is a pair of unknowns. Theta equals a comma b. So this instruction is telling us to take a sample of a b pairs. The question tells us what distribution to use as the prior for a and what distribution to use as the prior for b, but it doesn't say anything about a b pairs. So as per our general guideline, we'll assume the question means that a and b are independent under the prior distribution. Because they're independent, we can just generate a whole load of a samples and a whole load of b samples. Logically, we should really zip up these two lists to create a single list consisting of AB samples. I won't actually do that here because in the code that follows I just have to unzip that list of pairs for the calculations I need, but morally you should pretend I've zipped up these two lists into a single list of pairs. The next step is to compute weights by evaluating the data likelihood function. There's nothing to it really, it's just a matter of turning our likelihood function into code, then evaluating it for each one of our AB samples. This code uses NumPy vectorized operations, and you should look at it very closely to make sure you see that W is a vector. The final step is to draw whatever conclusions we want using our weighted samples. This is where the subtlety about multiple unknowns comes in. The question asked us, find the posterior distribution of B, but what we've actually found is the posterior distribution of the pair AB. So all I'm going to do is ignore the A values. If you have a function that returns a pair of random numbers and you only want to use one of them, you just ignore the other. That's exactly what I'm doing here, ignoring the A part of the AB pair and just plotting the B part. In code, this subtlety is so subtle that it probably either seems completely obvious or completely mystifying. I'm going to switch over now to the mathematical way of doing this, and then we'll see that it's a solid chunk of work actually, and that might make it clearer. Okay, the mathematical approach. Whether we're giving a computational answer or a mathematical answer, we start in exactly the same way with a likelihood function for the data little x. Now, here are the steps to follow. First step, write down the prior likelihood for theta, i.e. for the pair AB. The likelihood of a pair of random variables is just the product of the likelihood for each of them, assuming independence, which we shall do because the question doesn't tell us otherwise. And I just looked up Wikipedia to find the PDF for the distribution named here in the question, the exponential distribution. Next, find the posterior likelihood using Bayes rule. We'll just copy out the terms here, kappa times the prior likelihood of AB times the data likelihood of the data set x1 up to xn. The constant kappa is whatever is needed to make this function integrate to one when we integrate over all a and b. But I don't recognize this as any sort of standard likelihood function, so I can't write out a nice easy solution for kappa. Mathematica might be able to help us here, but probably not. Finally, report on the posterior. The question asked us, find the posterior distribution for B. What we just found is the posterior likelihood of the pair AB. So to get the likelihood for just B on its own, we have to integrate out A. This is called finding the marginal for B, or sometimes it's called marginalizing out A, or sometimes it's just referred to as applying the sum rule. Anyway, this is another intractable integral. You can see now why the computational approach is so handy. We can actually come up with answers rather than just throwing out up our hands and saying, I can't solve this integral. Okay, that's all there is to Bayesian inference. Let me just highlight the important points about what we've been doing. First, you should always follow the general procedure exactly as I listed it at the beginning of the video. Let theta be all the unknown parameters and find the posterior distribution for all of them. At the end, if you only want to know about one of the parameters, marginalize out the ones you want to ignore. 
technically, you don't actually have to include all the unknowns, but trust me on this, and for the first year of doing Bayesian calculations, always write down all the unknowns. After a year, you'll understand it all, and you'll know when you can take shortcuts. The next tip is something we didn't actually talk about. When you're answering these questions computationally and you need to work out the likelihood of the data, you can run into underflow problems. Let's say we've got a million data points, n equals one million. Then the likelihood of the data is the product of a million terms, often each of them fairly small, and so the likelihood of the full data set is minuscule. And if you just compute it naively, you'll run out of floating point accuracy. You need to be clever how you actually compute it, bearing in mind that in the end you'll be rescaling the weights anyway. The uh, code snippet on GitHub suggests how you can do this in your code. OK, so that's Bayesian calculations. All Bayesian questions are exactly the same. Write down the prior, find the posterior. What's actually the hardest part of Bayesian machine learning is working out how to frame your question as a Bayes rule type problem in the first place, i.e. how do you turn a real world problem into a question about random variables? Let's work through a final example to illustrate. Here's a question about classification. I'll give you a moment to read it to yourself. In the examples we've looked at so far, the question has clearly told us here is an unknown parameter. And so we knew we had to treat it as a random variable and find its posterior distribution. But in this question, where are the parameters? I can see lambda subscript L and lambda subscript F. Are those the parameters we're reasoning about? No, what we have to do is look more closely at the question, read between the lines and figure out what we're uncertain about. This question asks us, is the claim for X likely to be fraudulent? So that's what we're uncertain about, whether or not the claim is fraudulent. So next question, how do we represent our uncertainty? The Bayesian answer is always, we represent uncertainty by means of a random variable. Let's invent a random variable, capital theta, whose possible values represent the possible resolutions of our uncertainty. Let's say theta takes value either L or F. It takes value L if the claim is legitimate, F if it's fraudulent. Next, the Bayesians ask themselves, what's my prior on this unknown quantity? The question generously gives us a hint by using the word prior. It tells us, in my prior experience, 99% of claims I've seen are legitimate. I can use this as my prior. I'll say that the prior distribution on theta is theta is equal to L with probability 99%, theta is F with probability 1%. Okay, now we've got all the random variables properly defined, the rest of the question is just plain sailing. In fact, we've answered exactly this type of calculation before in section 4.2, so I'm not going to go over it again. All I wanted to do with this example was to give some guidance about how to look at a real world problem and think to yourself, aha, this is what I should treat as random. I think that's the only tricky thing about Bayesian questions. The rest is just the standard three-step procedure, exactly the same for every single Bayesian question. Okay, so we've learnt how to formulate a question as a Bayesian math problem, and we've seen how to solve it both computationally and mathematically. There's just one small piece left. What do we do with the posterior distribution that we've found? In these examples, all I've done so far is I've said, hey, we could plot a histogram of the posterior distribution. In practice, there are a couple of standard readouts that people give, and that's what we're going to look at in the next video.